Um, today, we're really, really pleased to welcome back Rick Sari of Incentive Labs. He's going to talk further with us today about helping teens and young adults with ADHD find the career path that's right for them, that's the right fit for them. I think that as parents, we all feel that we have the responsibility to help our teens or young adults explore career choices that will lead to success, help them build workplace skills and strengthen their functions, but how do we go about this? So. Rick Fire is going to tell us more today about strategies to help try out a career before attending college or vocational school, which careers tend to harness and highlight ADHD strategies, and what the best non-traditional career paths are for those with ADHD are. And then finally, how to find a school, a community college, a home, night school, vocational school, some options to develop strengths before getting started. So. Um, let me introduce Rick first. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he is MSNBA, the co-founder of Inventive Labs at Ames Brain, Massachusetts, created with his co-founder, Tom Bergeron, to help young adults specifically with learning distance differences find paths to success, paths such as gap years and entrepreneurship programs. Um, he has a great TEDx presentation, which you can watch for more details. Um, Prior to Inventive Labs, Rick was the CEO of a number of startup companies they created and grew before selling them. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree in engineering from the University of Virginia and an MBA from the Wharton School of Business. So, Rick, thank you so much for being with us today. We are very grateful for your time. We know it's valuable. Um, as always with Attitude Broadcast, Rick is going to present his slides and then take as many questions as he has time for. Thanks again, Susan, for having me back. Uh, I really enjoyed doing these because I get to share some of the experience that we've had uh, over the years, both in a lifetime, but also uh, in the last five years of working with individuals with learning differences. And uh, my background, I think it's always important to kind of reset it so people understand where my views are coming from and where my experience is coming from is that I'm really a civil engineer turn business guy and I really love kind of creating businesses. Um, so I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist and there's many aspects of ADHD where those folks have uh, a lot more experience in understanding some of the various elements of it. But I look at it through the lens of a business person, which I think is really important when you're looking at career choices and career options. And just to give you a background, so I I've created businesses from nothing into where we've been selling products in 60 countries for a software company that I did. And I happened to be the, got to be the CFO of a $350 million company. So my viewpoint is as that employer that understands ADHD and I can put it into that context for you. So I think it's important that you understand that before I start kind of pontificating here for you. So the purpose of this webinar, um, we were, were laughing a little bit about it beforehand. It's, it's a really big one, right? You know, how do I find the right career paths for folks? And it's so individualized. So I've had to take kind of a different approach uh, and use a kind of a technique that we use to help people kind of filter out their, their career path ideas to something that's manageable. So the purpose is to really help you figure out the most engaging career path possible where the chance for success is highest. Um, and this is for your son or daughter, based on the poll, it looks like most people are parents, but you'll see me flip sometimes and even talk about you. And some of this may apply to the parents too. Um, I think you'll smile when I say that. So that's the purpose of the webinar. And the prior webinar, really what I discussed about was how to pick a career first based on passion and intersect that with hopefully something you can make money at. Because if you're passionate about something and you can't make money at it, that's called a hobby. <laughs> and then also intersect it with something that you can become really good at. And if you can get to that sweet spot where passion intersects with money, intersects with something you can be really good at, that's potentially a path for success. But the last webinar I did really focused on after you've narrowed it down to two or three ideas, you can kind of then figure out what the path to success is there. This one's actually got to take what's probably more likely is that in that sweet spot, most people with ADHD have 20 or 100 or a thousand careers that fit in that spot. And it's really hard to narrow those down to a few. So what I'm gonna do is today is try to talk to you about based on your individual strengths and individual weaknesses, how to narrow that down. So the first step is first identifying that people with ADHD are unique individuals with tremendous strengths. I think we all understand that. But the reality is they have a few weaknesses as well, um, a few weaknesses too. And, 
if you look at ADHD strengths and, you know, you can, these are my views of ADHD strengths, not necessarily what you find out there on the internet. Um, if you look at ADHD strengths, they have tremendous value in the workplace. Where they don't have so much value is in the academic environment. Now, some people might argue with me on that, but I think it's true. So if you look at ADHD strengths, they're creative, they're industrious, they're hyper-focused, they're fun, they're empathetic, they have a lot of energy. These are the kinds of folks that you need in your business to be the game changers. Now, if you take all that and you throw it into a standard classroom environment, it's not such a match. So I think keep that in the back of your head as we move through the presentation. The reality, too, is, though, that with ADHD, there are some weaknesses, and these vary by individual. Um, the number one one I think that I see a lot is executive function challenges, you know, and planning and scheduling and timing. Hyper-focused, you might be surprised to see that as a weakness because a lot of people talk about that as a strength. Again, from the viewpoint of the business manager, hyper-focus can sometimes be seen as a weakness. So that's the way we're looking at this. Um, anxiety issues, I mean, that that's a big, big challenge with folks with ADHD in a lot of places they've struggled or been beaten down quite a bit and anxiety ensues and sometimes depression as well um, and also impulsivity that can be a challenge in the workplace you have to be careful with that so the list goes on and it varies for person so I'm going to stop there and talk about kind of the next step is given those strengths and given those weaknesses it's really important to get the job fit correct for somebody with ADHD. You have to find the right job in the right environment. And I would argue that people with ADHD really need to love what they do. It needs to be an engaging type of career. So loving what you do is important. I think not just for ADHD, quite frankly, for anybody, but let me try this. So I'll, I'll lead with a question. Um, not loving what you do can be what? Fill in the blank. Well, I can't see the internet audience, but I have this imaginary audience in front of me. So uh, not loving what you can do can be what? Sad. Okay. Yeah, I can buy that. Anybody else? Oh, difficult. Yeah, it can be difficult. Annoying. Yeah, okay, annoying. I, I can accept that, but clearly the people in my imaginary audience out here, they're not ADHD. Those adjectives aren't good enough. Um, at ADHD, people live with a different level of urgency and a different level of intensity. I think if you, ADHD folks would say, not loving what you can do, and I've heard this, can be excruciating or agonizing. Notice the words. <laughs> torturous. Those are good adjectives. People with ADHD are really good with adjectives or even potentially career threatening. Um, I think that's a little bit of the reality one there. So I want to share a story about myself. Um, and you have my, my point in this story is you have to be in the right career to find success and then one that matches you. So in my past life, um, in one of my startup companies, we sold the company to a strategic acquirer after we had grown it. And typically in the acquisition process, you get absorbed into the company. And what happened after we were absorbed, after about six months, the management team approached me and said, Rick, are you interested in running our finance group? Now, I had majored in entrepreneurship, but also finance. I did a double major. And they said, we think you can figure it out. And we have some other challenges for you. So that was a tremendous challenge. I mean, I went from running a small company with the finance included to a large company with offices in 42 countries around the world and trying to do the books and the finances for that, manage an audit, yada, yada, yada. Um, huge challenge, great learning curve. For two years, it was highly exciting. I made some changes. We got things adjusted. Things were starting to work, but then I had figured it out. And year three, it started to be the same thing over and over again. And I found myself, you know, the environment was great. The people were great. Um, the work experience was great. But the finance job itself did not have the same thrill of the hunt as doing a startup company. So for me, that was, that was huge. Um, and I literally fired myself. <laughs> I, I went into the CEO and said, I got to tell you, I can't do this job anymore. Um, I can't even get excited about going to Vegas for a one week finance conference because I can't sit through the finance sessions. I can't get excited about it. I'm afraid that I'm not going to do a good job and I'm going to hurt the company. So I need to take myself out of that position. And he looked at me and he said, really? 
as you can imagine. And I said, yeah, it was a great job. I was able to go to board meetings, et cetera, et cetera. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I got to do another startup company. And he's like, wow, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 45 years old. You have a wife and kids, right? Yep. And he, he knew them. Uh, and he said, and you don't see that as risky. And I said, no. I said, quite honestly, not being engaged in my job and not getting excited about it every day is a risky proposition for me. Eventually, I'm going to make a mistake and you're going to have to fire me. And I don't want that to happen. I feel much safer in my comfort zone of doing startup companies, even though they appear risky to other people. For me, they're not. Um, so that conversation ended really well. We parted on great terms. The next conversation was with my wife. And that was a little bit harder, as you can imagine. But um, we're still married. Uh, we've been married for a long time now. So the point of that story is to talk about you really need to understand your strengths and celebrate those, um, but also recognize truthfully your weaknesses. And this is especially important with ADHD. So one of the people that I love um, really – Dr. Ned Hallowell, he's been a good friend for years. He's a member of our advisory board. And I've seen him tell this story over and over again to newly diagnosed people or people are uncovering the fact that have it, they have an ADHD mind. And he tells the story about, um, you know, you have a Ferrari for a brain. I'm sure many of you have heard that. Um, you have a, the, the good news is with this diagnosis, you have a Ferrari for a brain. It's tremendously powerful, but it's capable of doing all kinds of amazing things. But the problem is you've been equipped with bicycle brakes to control it. Uh, and as Ned puts it, he says, the good news for you is I'm a brake specialist, so I can help you learn how to control this amazing brain. So I've t seen Ned tell the story, and I've seen people that have been new newly diagnosed go in with fear in their eyes and then start to feel better about themselves because of it. We think that way as well. So bear with me. Um, this isn't going to be as good as Ned. And it never is. But we need an analogy for careers, I think. A, similarly, a similar analogy. And uh, I would say that, you know, I'd ask you a question. To you, what is the most majestic animal on the planet? And bear with me on this. I'm a little bit tongue in cheek, but not really on this analogy. What's the most majestic animal on the planet? And like ADHD careers, you'll all have different answers. To me, one of the most majestic animals on the planet is the cheetah. It's powerful. It's lightning fast. It's able to hyper focus on its prey and strike and strike with precision. Right. Amazing creature. Seventy miles an hour very focused on what they can do, and they do it really well. But they tire easily, and they don't have a lot of endurance, and they sleep a lot. So I'm sure some of you are laughing a little bit out there. Um, my point in that is you don't take this cheetah, this amazing animal. What we don't want to do in the career context is take that cheetah and put them in a cage. They need to be out on the savanna where they can do what they do best. If you take a cheetah and put it in a cage next to all the other cats, I was at the San Diego Zoo. I think that's where this came from two or three weeks ago. And if you line up all the cats, you won't know what makes that cheetah different. You know, leopard, jaguar, lion, tiger, cheetah. Yeah, they're all cool. But if you put the cheetah out on the savanna and you show what it can really do and give it the environment that it needs – it's an amazing creature. Everybody needs a cheetah in their cat portfolio, in my view. So I'll tell you a story about that and, you know, the cheetah in the cage analogy. We had a young man approach us that had just finished his law degree in South Africa. Bachelor's degree, law degree, and then he got past the bar and he was sitting in an office. And I think he saw my TEDx talk and said, wow, you're right. I'm in the wrong place. Um, he said, I didn't know as a lawyer that I'd be sitting in here reviewing documents and editing documents. I'm also dyslexic, and this is not a match for me. I'm trapped in this cage. And he took his laptop, and he showed us where he was. He showed us his beautiful office, and then he pointed it out into the atrium, and it looked like the Emerald City in The Wizard of Oz, literally. And his reaction was, despite all this, I feel trapped. I've got to do something different. So in his case, he had done all this education to find out that he was in the wrong spot, um, and he was that cheetah in a cage in that scenario. So the point of this is let's try to avoid that. Um, and the way you can avoid that is really understanding how important job fit is to somebody with ADHD. Firstly, the job itself needs to be a match. 
And then secondly, and maybe more importantly, potentially, the job environment has to be good as well. So for happiness and success, it's crucial to find the right overall fit. And I kind of liken ADHD and careers um, and the career search to kind of like the kid in the candy shop. You know, it's tremendous. The list of careers is endless. So if you want the best list of ADHD careers, if that's what you're looking for in this webinar, I can't give you that. Um, there is not a list that fits everybody. It's different. You can Google it if you want, and you'll get a list of 20 or 30 careers. But I think you have to be a little bit more methodical about that. You need to understand the weaknesses that can be acknowledged and then take a look at how to handle that. So let me switch here. The job itself is probably the one thing that needs to be thought through initially, uh, followed by the environment. The job itself likely needs to challenge the mind. Not for everybody. Some people are happy being a lifeguard and daydreaming while they're working, um, but likely needs to challenge the mind. I would suggest that it really needs to leverage at least one of those ADHD strengths that I mentioned, or if your strength wasn't on that list, leverage that strength. And you need to understand the day-to-day -day of the job, um, not just the shiny brochure. Um, so if you look at... Um, um, a typical software job. We had a young man that came to us that got his four-year degree in software, got into the workforce and found out that working eight hours a day in front of a screen was not going to work for him. After getting the degree, he left software and went into the construction industry and worked as a laborer. And later came to us saying, you know, I'm just stuck. I hate laboring, but I have this degree. And we were able to find a place where he could not only use his software background, but also use his hands and be out and uh, working on things physically as well as coding. Um, so getting the job match is really right for people that have ADHD. Um, excuse me, I'm fighting off a cold here, so I'll keep trying to talk clearly. Um, the next step is how do you really look at jobs that are out there? The, the problem with ADHD, there might be a thousand jobs in that candy shop, but how do you filter that down to things that are appropriate for you? And the, what I call the ADHD challenges filter, it really needs to be different for everybody. So if you look at um, a picture here, the ADHD challenge filter, and I happen to have this right here. If you have your camera, my camera on, you can see this now. Um, this is really a filter that has different types of challenges associated with each layer and you can separate it out and customize it for yourself. I like visuals like that, kind of like the cheetah in the cage thing. Um, so if you look at the challenge filters, they're things like executive function issues, hyper-focus, anxiety and depression, and hyperactivity. They're things that you need to consider when you look at a potential job opportunity. And you need to break that down a little bit. So I think, like anything, ADHDers see a big challenge, but they don't know how to break it down. This is how you break down the job search a little bit. So again, looking from the management side, from executive function, what it looks like to the manager is different than what you may think it looks like for yourself. So in the typical workplace, there are realities like deadlines, team interaction, and communications that have to happen. With deadlines, there are consequences that are different in the workplace than they are in school. In school, you miss a paper, you turn it in a day late, you get a half a grade off. You don't turn it in, you get an F, and you're at a 2.0. And then the real fire doesn't start until you drop to 1.9 and the dean calls, and then you realize you're in trouble. It can take time for that to happen. In the work environment, if you miss that $6 million RFP submission, business proposal submission, because you overslept or you forgot, that's a problem. So the deadlines and consequences in the work environment were more significant and more severe than they are in school, I would argue. There's also a team interaction component that has to happen. Being 10 to 15 minutes late for meetings is really a non-starter in most companies. It just doesn't work. After a while, if you miss that meeting all the time, you're going to be let go. Um, so executive function, you have to be aware of, you know, if that's an issue for you, maybe you shouldn't be in a job that works that way. And finally, communications. A big challenge that we see is responding to emails or texts. It's okay in life, maybe, I guess. Not, not in my life, but in most people, some people's lives to respond five, five days later to a text or five days later to an email. In the work environment, that doesn't work. Um, that's a problem. So those are kind of negative views of executive function issues. Now I'm going to turn that around and talk about the workarounds. You know, 
if you have challenges there, there's a plethora of jobs out there that you can do that don't require some of the same constraints. So an example I'll give, a story I'll tell. A young woman named Rebecca uh, came to our program from Australia, and she was a bank teller. Um, she was a bank teller, but she wanted to be a fashion designer. In the bank teller job, the issue she had is they had a specific meeting they had to be in line for every day, and she was always late for that. And the way she described it was people would be yelling down the hall, Rebecca, Rebecca, where are you? You know, come to the meeting. Where are you? What is going on? And she was always late. And she showed up um, after coming from Australia to our program the night before. The next day, she insisted on being in, and we had a 10 o'clock start meeting. And I hear this ruckus out in the kitchen. And I hear glasses falling and backpacks dropping, and, and it was like 10.02, literally 10.02. And I hear, shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, she was actually saying something else, but I'll keep it uh, G-rated here. <laughs> and uh, she was yelling, and I came out like, what's wrong? She said, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. And you can see the pressure and the anxiety that was in the, that, that shout-out that she was doing. And I said, Rebecca, it's okay. You're here at the lab. We understand these things. We'll work with you on that, but they're, you know, relax. It's going to be okay. And you could just see all this, the anxiety wash out of her body. Like, oh, right. It's a different environment. So for executive function workarounds, you need to find things where those issues aren't as severe, where schedules are flexible. You know, an example of that are the trades. When was the last time you had a contractor show up on time? or a, a plumber or an electrician or even show up at all, right? They have they can set their own schedule and their own time and work to their own beat. Software development, I didn't I had a guy once that couldn't show up until two in the afternoon and he'd work till four in the morning. But I didn't care because he was so productive. Um, that was the only time he could work. You get him in at ten o'clock and it just did not happen for him. So find opportunities where schedules are flexible where team interaction is minimal potentially. If you have a problem with showing up on time for meetings, there are jobs out there where you don't have to go to meetings. Software support, you're basically interacting with customers. You spend very little time in meetings. If you're in sales, you can set meetings for later in the day on your schedule, not at 8 a.m. where you may not be able to make it happen. Um, landscaping, art, et cetera. There's so many op you know, different kinds of business opportunities out there for you that don't require a scheduled team environment. And communication timeliness. Um, think of farming. Cows don't text. Cows don't email. Um, you know, charter boat captain. Boat leaves at seven. If you're not on it, the captain's leaving. Not a lot of communication happens there. They put their uh, business cards on the bars all around the harbor, and that's how they get clients to show up at eight o'clock for their or seven o'clock for their charter boat tour. So think about those types of things. So the second filter um, is hyperfocus, and many people say hyperfocus is a great strength. But in the workplace, there are organizational goals that have to be met, and perfection is not always required. So to me, hyperfocus and perfection are kind of intertwined a little bit. Um, you keep hyperfocusing because you've got to get to the perfect answer, um, and that can be a problem in the workplace. So for managers, if somebody's hyperfocused on the wrong thing, that can drive them crazy. If they're hyper-focused on the right thing and killing it, that's fantastic. So you have to be aware of the fact that if you really truly hyper-focus and you don't listen to reason sometimes, that's going to cause you a problem in the workplace. And in software, as an example, perfection is not required. It's the hardest thing for developers to let go of their code when there's still bugs in it. But from a business perspective, you got to let it go because the developers have to be paid and they don't understand that. And then you fix the bugs and hope that uh, customers don't find them. So hyper-focus can be a good thing and a bad thing. But there are workarounds. There are jobs where hyper-focus is required. So think about it. I, uh, I have a torn distal bicep tendon. I uh, lifted something heavy about three months ago. I wanted my surgeon to hyper-focus and I wanted perfection. I didn't want anything else. Also, think of air traffic controllers. If you want to be an air traffic controller, they should hyper-focus. They don't want to be talking to the guy next to him on the scope about the game last night, or they don't want to uh, you know, not be perfect. Not being perfect in that environment is a problem. If you're a musician and you dare to do the Freebird guitar solo, you better do it perfect. I know people that have done that for high school recitals. Next slide. Anxiety and depression. 
again, from the business perspective, it's really hard for managers to understand anxiety. If they're not in the club and they don't have it themselves, it's not necessarily easy for them to understand anxiety. Um, the fight, flight, or freeze concept works. You know, that's the way it kind of manifests itself. If you're fighting for the right thing in the business world, great. If you're fighting for the wrong thing, that's a problem. But flight or freeze are really tough. If you don't show up for work because of anxiety, managers don't get that. If you just sit there and freeze and you don't do anything towards the project, managers don't get that. So in certain job environments, it can be paralyzing and affect um, performance. So I had a young man in one of my startup companies that had a percentage of ownership in the thing. We were brand new, living payroll to payroll, very exciting environment. I loved it. Um, very exciting environment, and we were fighting our way through it, and we eventually made it work. But this young man, every day he came in, and he, because he had ownership in this thing, he was freaking out about how much cash we had left and how the deal was going to close. He couldn't do his job because he was so anxious about the whole thing collapsing. And he left. He had to leave. He eventually went and worked for a large software company where cash was not a problem, and he's been there for 25 years and has been successful at it. So if anxiety is a thing, you need to understand that there may be other ways around it. So workarounds, figure out where jobs are in this filter. So in the anxiety filter, figure out where job, your anxiety triggers are minimized. If being on stage is a knee buckling experience for you, find a job that minimizes public speaking. So accounting, you don't have to do a lot of public speaking. Healthcare, it's unlikely you have to do a lot of public speaking. It's one-to-one. -one. So think about finding jobs where that anxiety gets minimized, that anxiety trigger is minimized. If you're introverted, find a career that avoids a lot of interpersonal interaction if it causes significant anxiety. There are things that you can do and careers that you can have where that doesn't happen. In accounts payable, um, in the finance department that I ran, people were very happy to place orders and do things like that. And there wasn't a lot of interaction with folks. Um, it was a lot of online purchasing. So don't go overboard. A little anxiety is a good thing. It can really drive performance, but you got to be honest about it. When I graduated with my civil engineering degree, I found this really cool company that built 3,000 foot tall towers and just the tallest structures in the world were these radio towers. And I thought, wow, that would be really cool. They're really significant challenges with buckling and everything else. I went and interviewed with the company and they said, Rick, um, what part of the job is you have to go to the top of these things and change the light bulbs and maintain the uh, equipment. And I was like, I'm out. Um, no way. Fear of heights. Um, actually, I'm a private pilot and I'm afraid of heights, but it's different when you're standing on a tower, as people will tell you. There's no way I could have climbed that tower. Really great job. I was really disappointed. I asked if there was any way around having to do that. They said, nope, it's part of the job. If you design it, you got to climb it. And I'm like, I'm out. So for me, my anxiety really ruled out that particular job. The last filter to look at is hyperactivity. In the typical workplace, the realities today are many jobs are desk jobs. And for whatever reason, and it's starting to change back a little bit, people are going to these wide open, open plan offices because they think it promotes teamwork. That's great for everybody else that uh, has, you know, as Dr. Hallowell puts it, attention surplus disorder. That's great for them. But for people with ADHD, that's a challenge. Um, and many companies have a meeting culture. Um, so the best way to talk about this is maybe to give some obvious examples of issues that appear. So spinning around in a chair during a staff meeting at IBM when they're planning a future big project is probably not a good thing to do. Or fidgeting and accidentally disconnecting Wi-Fi for the room while the meeting's going on is probably not a good thing to do. And losing it when a meeting lasts longer than 45 minutes it's not going to keep your job. Some I've been in eight hour meetings. They've been painful sometimes. Um, so again, if you have an issue with sitting still and being at a screen and not being outdoors, there are some really simple workarounds for that. You're not bound to, you know, consider jobs where you're not bound to a desk or a screen. I mean, these are kind of obvious to me, but I think it's still worth saying because it's part of your filter process. If the company has a progressive work environment, 
then that can work. So if you look at you know Google as an example, you'll see they have open areas, they have bistro areas, they have quiet rooms, and then they have eggs that you can sit in and totally block out the world. So if a company that has that kind of environment versus a wide open space, maybe that can work for you. Um, but also consider being outdoors on your feet with people facing jobs, um, things like you know, being a guide in the backcountry or a flight attendant and, and uh, you know, always on your feet interacting with people, um, work for the park service outdoors as a ranger. There's so many different kinds of jobs where you can be active and engaged as opposed to in the office environment. Um, it may be a smaller percentage now in this modern society, but they are still there. Um, the trades are a classic one. Um, you could be in any kind of environment in the trades. So. Given that, you now I've kind of given you some examples for this filter. Rate yourself on each one of these elements. So this is where the customization comes in. If you Google ADHD careers, you're going to get a list of 30 of which one may work. I think you have to do a little bit more work. You have to break it down further. So rate yourself on executive function, no issue or big issue. Hyperfocus, anxiety, hyperactivity, and then change, change these out. So executive function, no issue, not a big deal. Hyperfocus, yeah, I do that. Um, hyperactivity, big issue. Anxiety, not so much. And then from that, you've got your own personal set of filters that you can apply to the potential jobs that you're looking at. So that's an approach that I've tried to come up with to help people break it down. Because people with ADHD, the big issue can be overwhelming. But if you give them tools to kind of break it down and start ruling stuff out, it makes the big picture question a little bit more manageable. So is it useful? Yeah, different people need different tools. I mean, some people will look at this and say, ah, that's not going to work for me. That's fine. But many will look at it and say, you know, that's a helpful way of looking at it. You know, when we talk to folks about careers, they say, I don't know. I want to do everything. I don't know what I can do. It's like, well, let's start ruling some things out. Um, maybe that'll help. You know, sometimes we throw out, what about mortician? Is that something that you want to do? Oh, no, no, no. I never want to be a mortician. Okay, we're making progress. We ruled something out. And then keep going down that path. And before you know it, you start to end up with some careers that could make some sense going forward. So then kind of wrapping up kind of the concept here is how do I figure out if my final choices are truly a good fit? You know, you might have five or 10 final choices that you think are a good fit. How do you, how do you figure that out? You got to try them. Um, you can't Google it. You can't read the shiny brochures. You can't, you know, really figure out whether the job is, is real for you or not until you try it. And what are ways to do that? You could do it through a gap year. Um, so gap years, if you're graduating from high school and you don't know what you want to do, colleges are now really embracing the concept of gap year where you defer your admission and then explore things. Um, consider a gap year that gives you the opportunity to explore potential career options first. Um, you know, you can build maturity and independence by living away from home. You build those life skills like doing laundry or boiling water, um, you know, some of the things that are amazingly not known yet at that age, and build those skills first before the crush of academic hits. And we always say, you know, if you can find the right kind of gap year where you're really figuring out the why behind going why you need to go to college, that increases, increases the chances of getting through college or through that environment. But you have to avoid the see the world gap years. Think of the see the world gap year for somebody for ADHD. They go out and they see the world and they come back with, oh my gosh, there's so many other things I could do. That's kind of the last thing you need sometimes. You're really trying to get it down to a focus to just get them started on a career path. It doesn't need to be something they're gonna do for the rest of their lives. They're gonna have six or seven career paths down the road as they go. So consider a gap year as an option. Internships. Uh, those are only for college kids. Mm, hang on a minute. Not so much anymore because with the current economy, people are looking to hire more, as you can imagine. And chief diversity officers are now a thing at companies. They're trying to find ways to broaden their brain portfolio and their experiences. And internships are now starting to exist for people that are not in college. So we've been pushing this really hard and saying, hey, we've got align into some of the game-changing individuals that can really come into your company, think outside the box beyond the people that have made it through the standard college degree process potentially, and change the way your business operates. I've seen that over and over in my company. 
uh, companies that I've done, the people with learning differences are the game changers, in my opinion. And companies are starting to realize that now and give them college level positions alongside the college internships with the same chance to earn a job because they realize that college isn't necessarily the only way for people to become successful, especially when it's designed for people that think a certain way. So it's a great way, if you can get that internship, it's a great way to get uh, to give that career a try before investing heavily in the training, the time, or the education. So my story was I was a civil engineer, I mean a mechanical engineer, because I was, uh, when I started out, I always wanted to be an aerospace engineer. So I went into the mechanical side of it, got through my third year of engineering school, and while I was going through engineering school, I worked part-time in the summers as a surveyor, and I started to question my mechanical engineering degree in my third year of college, of course. And then I went and out to Boeing and saw what it was like to be a mechanical engineer at Boeing. And I found the sea of cubes with numbers on them and an engineer that had been there for 20 years designing a machine part the same way, a fuel pump to make it smaller, lighter, smaller, lighter for 20 years. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't do that. I need to do something bigger. I need to do civil engineering and be outside. And I shift majors had that discussion with my dad and uh, was told that he was not going to pay for the, the fifth year that it was going to take to get done. I said, that's fine. I'll keep working in engineering and learn along the way. Long story short, that was easy back then. It cost 3500 for tuition. Now it's 75000 for a year at the University of Rochester, for example. So education now costs $300,000 for a four-year degree. You want to find out these things beforehand. Um, try the jobs. Entrepreneurship is potentially an option for folks. Um, people say, oh, that's risky. Think of my example with the finance story I gave you. To me, it's not risky because it leverages my strengths and minimizes my weaknesses. So for entrepreneurship, it can be great for people with ADHD. Um, the challenge we've got with entrepreneurship in the ADHD world, we always talk about Richard Branson or Charles Schwab or the list of all the famous people. That's unattainable for most people. So we created a website called necessarybrilliance.org um, along the lines of the TEDx that I did. It's really people telling stories about how they became successful and hacks and people you probably haven't heard of, but they've had highly successful careers in entrepreneurship. Um, so it's a really engaging site in that way because it shows that you don't have to be Richard Branson to be an entrepreneur. You can create an idea, do something small. It's a tremendous learning opportunity. What happens a lot when people do that is they know they're passionate about it and they know they can make money at it, but they aren't world class yet and they might need to get more training. So it's a great way to motivate somebody to say, now I know why I need to get that extra education or go to school or do something different to get that experience that I need. So entrepreneurship can be great for people with ADHD. You get to work on all kinds of different things. There's also the thrill of the hunt, the excitement, the hours are crazy, the hours are different. It can be perfect, and it can be less risky than taking somebody that's ADHD and putting them in a cube in a large company and everyone says, oh, that's safe. I say maybe not so much. And the last point that I'll make there is you don't have to be a CEO to be an entrepreneur. You can work for a startup. There are well-funded startups out there where you can get jobs. So it's it's an interesting area for people with ADHD. And the initial reaction is, oh, that's risky. My pushback on that is maybe not as risky as you think. So the other thing you can do, these are just kind of hacks. I, I hate that term, but I'll use it here now, hacks to, to figure out what your career path should be. There's inexpensive job training, in some cases free stuff that I'll talk about in a second, where you can really dive deeply into a career path without making that $300,000 commitment that's required now for a private college education. And there are places like software development camps like General Assembly or Launch Academy that will bring people in and for ten dollars or $12,000 get them fully trained up in just what they need to know to develop software and then get placed in a job or an internship and try it out. That's an inexpensive way to try something that you're pretty confident is your career path and, and make sure it works. There are art schools like Sin Studios in Montreal where you can learn graphic design and try it out and see if you could see yourself in that industry. It doesn't cost that much. There are culinary schools. You can go to a community college and learn how to be a chef. Um, the trades, the, that's in a mind-blowing industry to me right now. I've talked to people that have 
that, that are carpenters that have shut down because they can't get people to come work for them. And the law of supply and demand says what? That sooner or later, the cost for those, you know, you, you're going to be able to make $200,000 a year being a carpenter, and you're going to be able to retire at 45, and you're going to set your own hours. So to me, the trades are a potential awesome opportunity for people with ADHD. The challenge is many younger folks just don't want to do it. Um, so that's still out there. For somebody, it's going to be the right option. And then finally, higher education. You know, our society is really about getting people into college. And college is just, it's the, you go to a cocktail party or you see your friends, it's always the t first question they asked. But you don't have to do it the normal way. You know, I would argue if you have ADHD, community college is a great way to try different things very inexpensively. And you can do it full time or you can do it part-time and maybe get an internship in the potential career and then they start to feed on themselves. You learn something at school, you use it in work and you get better and you get excited. That's what happened to me with civil engineering. The more I learned, the more excited I got. My grades went from decent to like 4.0 because I was locked in, I loved it. Um, so community college is a great way to prime the pump. Night school is an option. Again, it's not the first choice, but think about it. In night school, it's usually taught by people that are in industry and not academics, and there's a little bit more of a connection there for people with ADHD, you can take one or two classes a semester, and if it takes six years, who cares? At the end of the day, you can still get that degree from that university, tick that box, and move into the, the industry. And then there are online options. So if you don't want to do community college and you don't want to do night school, there are online options that are very inexpensive. Coursera is free. Um, Udemy and Code Academy are places where you can pay a little bit of money and get high level, high quality classes in a particular industry or field where you can try it and see if this, if your mind works with it, great. If it doesn't, okay, don't step away and try something different. So these are just some kind of hacks to try different things first before you make that significant college investment. And these are all things that help you, quite frankly, build your filter. Um, you know, trying these things, you can see what's working for you and what doesn't, and kind of reducing the amount of options for yourself. So kind of in summary here, I think it's really important to get people to at least get a glimpse of the day-to-day -day before committing to college. It's extremely hard to do with all the pressures on us and our young adults to take the standard path. I mean, it takes courage, but also strategies and planning to avoid it. So if you could try the job first and make sure it's a fit. You can reduce that funnel down and maybe get it to those two or three ideas and then define your pathway to success once you figure that out. So back to my analogy, I think hopefully this sticks with you. Hopefully you like it, but please don't put the cheetah in a cage. Society is trying to get us to do that. It takes courage and forethought and planning to avoid that put them out on the savanna where they can truly demonstrate what amazing and majestic creatures they are. So with that, okay. um, I think we're ready Rick, for questions. Thank you so much. Really inspirational. I think um, you have a lot of uh, fans here among the listeners who were saying how, how, uh, how encouraged this, what, encouraging this was. The questions, however, are mostly around the pragmatic difficulties mm -hmm. of getting from here to there. Um, Great. So um, here's someone who says, I'm really interested in entrepreneurship. Um, how should I start? At, what's an entry-level way to go about it? Um, so I, I think – so if you look at entrepreneurship, it has some of the exact same challenges that I just kind of went through with the career search, right? I have a hundred ideas or a thousand ideas. How right. do I narrow those ideas down to something that's distillable and achievable? And there are lots of um, incubators around the country that have no charge services in some cases where you can go in and throw out ideas and compete in pitch competitions for your ideas and find investors, et cetera. Um, that is good for people that really understand kind of the underlying elements of businesses, but there are programs out there where you can attend and learn entrepreneurship. I don't know, in night school, at colleges, um, there are programs out there that do that. Ours is one of them. Um, but you can narrow things down and find 
you know, your business idea and take it forward. That's one thing that's really hard for people to do, but you can get there. The first step though, you know, don't just think that you have to create a business to do it. If you Google, go to meetup and look meetup startups um, online, and you'll find in your local area where people are getting together to talk about startup ideas and exchanging ideas and maybe looking for people to join them in startups. Those are great communities to reach out to and just start networking. That's how you can find a job at a startup um, and, and look at things that way. And finally, you know, job boards, there are startup companies that advertise positions. And if you can find one there, I kind of say sometimes the best way to learn about a startup first is to be in one, not the CEO, not the founder, not the co-founder, but somebody that takes a position in a company that can learn and watch and absorb and see how it all works. And then from that, you know, maybe down the road, you can figure out what extra education you need or whether you have this idea that you think you can kind of really take to market. So entrepreneurship is a bigger picture idea. But if you narrow it down to bite-sized chunks and things where you can at least get your foot in the door, that's usually all it takes. Okay, great. Um, question about uh, how do we introduce teams to summer jobs? Summer jobs would seem to be a great way to try things out. Um, and, you know, in today's world, they're hard to, to, to get oftentimes. Well, I would maybe take job out of the uh, vocabulary uh, and, and, okay. and consider – consider a summer position where it's potentially even a volunteer position. So we had a young man that was in our program that was really interested in biology, um, marine biology. And to test that, to understand what a marine biologist was, he went and worked for a nonprofit and they had him go out onto the beach and count horseshoe crabs mm -hmm. and saw that that's part of what a marine biologist does. And he was like, I love this. I love going out and interacting with nature and counting and also then taking the data and analyzing it and drawing conclusions from it. So that was a real energizer uh, for him. Other people have That's tried great. things like Habitat for Humanity or something like that, where you can get mm -hmm. out and see if you like you like the trades. Um, so the list kind of goes on and on. There's lots of different ways that you can test and try things. But if you're always looking for that paid job, you got to think of the reality. Making 10 or $11 an hour in that paid job isn't really going to move the needle against the future potential investment of college. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, so getting stuck in a low-paid job that you don't like doesn't give you any training or exposure to anything new. And so, yeah. Um, and, and finally, just Question. a quick comment. On, yeah. Can I make a quick comment on that? So sure, yes, also yes. getting that low paid job that you're flipping burgers or something, that's probably something that people will dread and not do well in <laughs> and maybe get fired in because they don't show up. Um, finding that engaging thing, even if it's for no pay, it can be energizing and exciting and they will want to show up and become successful in that. And it adds to their resume, even though they didn't get paid. And employers, right. when they're looking at that, they like to see that somebody showed up, did something and stuck with it and getting that menial job where you don't, you know, maybe it doesn't go on your resume, so it's not a big deal, but getting that menial job is sometimes risky. Okay. Absolutely. Um, um, the military. Three or four questions here about mm -hmm. um, joining the military. Um, um, Liz says, "My child's very patriotic. She stated many times that when she grows up, she want to be wants to be in the Marines. How can I help her understand that that may not play to her ADHD strengths?" Um, mm. Yeah, that's, again, I think a very individualized question. So we've had right. folks come through our programs that have gone into the military, and it's been really good for them. It's engaging. Right. Um, they learn a lot, and they needed some structure. But for some people, mm -hmm. it's not as good a match. Um, so I think that's a hard one to experience. So I understand the question, too. You can't do an internship yeah, in the military yeah. to see what right. it's like. But, you know, talking to recruiters, but also networking with people that are truly in the military and maybe freshly in the military. What we try mm -hmm. to do a lot of times is pair people up with mentors or even people in the industries and career paths that they're looking at. 
and just meeting with people and say, hey, tell me what the real life is like, because they have the brochure view of the military, right, which has you've seen those articles right. on the Super Bowl, those ads on the Super Bowl of all these creative, exciting right. things. What's the reality of the military? How do you get positioned in the military? So you do a lot of testing to see where you're going to be in the military and what jobs you qualify for. You could take those tests as an example and then look at the list of jobs that you would qualify for and see if that is a turn on or a turn off. So there's ways to kind of attack it through networking, testing, and you know, doing the best you can with a very difficult challenge of getting experience. Okay. Um, you know, as I'm listening to you, Rick, I'm reminded, I think there's a, a, a program out there that will match you to, to try different fields. Um, I think they'll match you with a florist or they'll match you with um, something for two weeks to try it out. Have you heard of that? I'm trying, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I remember. Um, but anyway, that would be really a helpful sort of process, right, to, to actually spend time with someone doing a field that you think you're interested in. Yeah, that, that, I think that's critical. Is fine using whatever tools you're. I don't know what the what you're talking about. I thought you were talking about maybe career aptitude tools that are out there. There are tools out there where you can take tests right. online, and then they give you a list of relevant careers. Yeah. Um, you have to be right. careful with those because they're kind of a broad brush approach. But if it's actually right. a, a, job, a board where you can get an actual position and try something out for a few weeks, that would be awesome. So yeah, if somebody knows that yes. and email. Email that to uh, us. To We'd love to it. know. Yeah, try to find it. It actually was literally you paid for it, but it was a matching with someone in a profession for several weeks in order to try it. So, um, okay. So, there's a specific question here, which is an interesting one. So, I'll give it to you. My son, our son is 11. He despises hmm. school. He really wants to. We're encouraging him to study a trade. He's interested in being a chef. Chef. We're trying to get him to stay through high school. He's counting now the days till he's 16, and he can quit school. <laughs> what should we do? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Um, it is tough. Yeah. I think. I think. It goes back to really finding something, and I think you're trying to do that. Finding something that can engage them. Um, again, I've we've learned over and over that if you can figure out why you're going to school and what the motivation for going to school is, then that makes it a whole lot easier for them. Because they're also always asking, you know, why do I have to do the homework if I can get 100% on the test? And when you say, well, mm -hmm. because, that's not a good answer for folks um, with mm -hmm. ADHD. So I think it, you have to work probably a little bit more extra hard at finding that particular, um, you know, passion that's there. But also there are alternative schools out there that people can consider. Right. Um, for what it's worth, um, one that we've come across is Fusion Academy that has one-to-one -one learning for kids that are younger. And uh, I think they do a great job in really focusing on passion and teaching and educating them differently. And they do, you know, people will panic and say, well, great, then my son or daughter may not get into college. They do place people into college as well out of their programs. So I would say, you know, one thing to consider if school is just the environment is wrong. If there are programs that you can find like a fusion or other schools out there that teach differently and have alternative learning styles, sometimes that might be what it takes if they really, really, really can't stomach the traditional school environment. Right. Okay. That's, that sounds, that makes a lot of sense. Um, question from someone says he was thinking back to what color is my parachute, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was a set of tools to help someone work through, um, is that relevant for ADHD or ask, ask several people? Boy, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I read that book. Oh my gosh. It must've been 20 years ago. So exactly, my knowledge, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> my knowledge, I just remember the other one, I had a bunch of self tests. The, yeah, the other one is, yeah. the other one is who moved my cheese. Right. And uh, right, that, that was right. another small book. So it's a lot of those things apply. I think I'd have to say, I, I don't remember the book well enough, but from what I do right. remember, is that it's to the generic and the problem with ADHD is the generic doesn't always fit. You know, their minds work differently. Jobs that they mm -hmm. can be in are different where they can find success and what color my is my parachute is kind of a mainstream book, but I think the filtering concept and the understanding of where your strengths and weaknesses are, that's kind of exactly what I'm talking about. But it's it's right. got to be customized. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Um 
there, someone posted there's a newer young adult version of What Color Is My Parachute, so who knows. If oh, I good. recall it, it was about that figuring out your own strengths, but perhaps it's still mm-hmm. out there. Somebody will tell us. Um, uh, we have a question that's sort of, sort of off topic a little bit, but it's interesting, and there are a number of people asking it. Should you tell employers you have ADHD, or is that something that may affect their decision to hire you negatively? Um, that's a good one. It, it depends, um, on the Mm -hmm. job. Uh, for example, if you were applying for an accounting position and you were not detail oriented, um, that potentially could be a problem. Um, but I think, I think it's the kind of thing that'll be obvious from your resume for most employers. They'll see the creativity that pops from your resume. Um, and then they will find positions for you based on your resume. And then after you're in, I think you have to be careful. A lot of people understand that ADHD is treated as a disability under the ADA, and people have to make accommodations as a result. It's ADHD accommodations are a little bit more difficult in the workplace environment. I think it's better to just try to find a job where you can fit in, where those accommodations don't need to be made. So right. Right. you kind of have to feel it out. Sometimes you can talk to somebody and you'll know Um, The senior person is somebody who's ADHD, um, and it's probably okay to share it, but it's it's kind of a judgment call in that regard. Yeah, I would agree with that. And there are a number of people here who were saying for that um, same thing. Mm. Someone wrote, no, exclamation point. That's the question. Do you you tell you have ADHD? Yeah. Um, Yeah. um, I think that the rule of thumb being speak to your employer about what you can do for your employer rather than the other way around. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, do you know of any places, the question, um, that um, are ways to teach kids how to improve executive function? Well, I think for us, the approach that we take is we throw a lot of different things at folks like procrastination hacks um, at at people that have ADHD and executive function challenges, because 10, if you throw 15 at them, only one may work for a particular individual. Um, so it's, mm-hmm. it's, again, it's a very personalized, customized thing. So procrastination hacks, we do a lot of. The other thing that we absolutely enforce is calendaring. So if you mm-hmm. aren't familiar with tools like Trello, uh, I would suggest it's T-R-E-L-L-O. Um, It's a very simple tool that allows you to lay out your tasks in a graphical manner and drag them from, you know, starting to complete and you get the satisfaction of moving it to complete and you can integrate your tasks and your calendar together with Trello to where you get reminders like the day before an important meeting that you might want to not come in in flip flops and shorts. You can build all that into the system and kind of calendarize people's lives. We think that's, The biggest thing with executive function is forcing yourself to write something down, put a date on it, and then later have it automatically remind you that something's about Mm -hmm. to happen. And that, coupled with procrastination hacks, is the way we kind of attack executive function. And when people leave our programs, we want them to be very fluent in those tools. Right. So you're teaching tools to manage executive function. That sounds great. Speaking of your programs, yeah, um, yeah, um, uh, some one of the listeners says your webinars have been so helpful. Yeah, and to be honest, I don't like to be promotional about that. I'm trying to share stories of what we've learned. Um, you know, you could track us down and we'll be happy to talk to you about it, but I don't really like talking about that in this particular context, uh, if okay. that's okay. Even just um, the, the general place they can find out more about what you do, maybe. Yeah, so if you go to inventivelabs.org, our website, you can okay. find out more and reach out to, you know, hit us with questions on the info Lab. inbox. Org. Yeah, my, okay. my mission yeah. here is to really kind of share just some of the, the stories sure. that we've learned over time and help people out. Well, it's been super helpful, and um, we are really grateful for your time, Rick, and all that you've – your approach is so refreshing. Um, so thank, well, thank you so you. much for, for being here and for coming back. And thanks, everybody, well, th- for listening in today. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to share. Yep.